imagination is far more important than we realize. One crucial function of our brain is to imagine future events. I want to tell you how you can use your imagination to help OIGs remain vibrant. Here's a photo of my son in Central Park, near where John Lennon was shot. My son's passions are music and film composition, and it so happens that Hollywood filmmakers play a pretty important supporting role in the story I'm going to tell you. I'd like you to think about the following quote over the next 15 minutes. No one ever invented something that someone didn't imagine first. But before we do that, think back to a time when you were um, about 9 or 10, 11 years old, to those few weeks before Halloween. And by then you had a few Halloweens under your belt. You were thinking about your costume. And I'll bet a lot of you were also thinking, hey, I want to get more candy this year than last year. Maybe last year you conned your sister into swapping her Mars bar for a box of your raisins. But then your mother found out and confiscated your stash. So maybe this year you think, okay, I'll give my sister two boxes of raisins to keep her mouth shut. And maybe you and your friends plan to skip the houses that gave out apples last year, and that frees up your time to hit up the houses that give out chocolate. What you were doing was using your memories to make the future what you wanted it to be. Peter Skobelik, a scenario planner, has a great way of explaining how we do this, how this happens. We rummage around in our mental file cabinet and we come up with some analogy from the past and this helps us think about what to do now to help make the future what we want it to be. So what we're doing is weighing data or information from the past to take calculated risks. Horse races, actuarial tables, what month to schedule an outdoor wedding, these are all examples of how we look to the past to take calculated risks about the future. Has anybody seen Moneyball? That's a great example of how this works in the baseball industry. This is all fine and dandy when the past can provide us with that data to assess those risks. But what happens when change is so unprecedented, so unlike anything we've ever seen or experienced before, that we have nothing in our mental file cabinet or very little, no antecedents from the past to help us make good decisions. What if I told you we could use our imaginations to help us simulate a data-rich future despite having no antecedents? If you think of risk and uncertainty as on a continuum, risk is at the end where we have data from the past, where we have information, something in our mental file cabinet, to help us take future, to help us calculate future risks. Uncertainty is way on the other end of that spectrum. In fact, uncertainty has been defined as the inability to draw analogies from past experiences. This is exactly what the world's been facing the past few years. It's been said we live in VUCA times. Volatility, uncertainty, ambiguity, complexity, these are what characterize our world. We've got these intractable problems with no obvious or immediate solutions, and we find ourselves with no antecedents or very few to help us out. Scenario planning is a tool where you create stories about the future that paradoxically help guide us in the here and now. It's not science fiction, it's not a silver bullet, it's not about predicting the future, and it's not about creating an exhaustive list of every possible thing that could happen in the future. What it is, is a way of using our imaginations to push beyond the often incorrect assumptions that we make about things, and it's a tool to create new choices for ourselves. So how did all this start? It's a great story. Following World War II, a bunch of scientists at Rand Corporation started trying to develop a science of war. The idea was that if you could assign probabilities to things to substitute quantification and rationality for fuzzy, squishy, immeasurable judgment, that we would beat the odds in the event of an atomic war. So one of the scientists who was at the Rand Corporation was a physicist named Herbert Co Herman Kahn. So Kahn realized it was impossible to quantify risks related to an atomic war because, the idea, because there, it was unprecedented. There had never been an atomic war before. We had no analogies. There was nothing in our mental file cabinet to draw on, no antecedents. We were all the way over on the uncertainty end of the continuum. Scientific American described Kahn as thinking the unthinkable. 
which was a characterization he actually really liked. He was a very colorful person. He loved to tell stories. So the Rand Corporation was located in sunny Southern California, and as it turns out, these scientists all partied with Hollywood filmmakers. They'd apparently all get together and chew the fat over physics and films. And so Kahn would tell these filmmakers stories, these, uh, you know, uh, about the many possible ways in which nuclear technology and nuclear weapons could be used by hostile nations or our opponents. Has anybody ever seen Stanley Kubrick's Dr. Strangelove? It's one of the funniest films ever made. An unhinged Air Force colonel orders a nuclear attack on the Soviet Union. And this leads to this mad scramble to try and stop a B-52 from dropping the bomb. So Peter Sellers, a fantastic actor, plays Dr. Strangelove. And Stanley Kubrick modeled him after Herman Kahn. So I kind of think that these parties may, with these filmmakers, may have been where Kahn came up with the idea of Ersatz experience. Basically, he said, it's using our imaginations to create a fake antecedent where we don't have anything in our mental file cabinet. Kahn said, let's make up stories about the future, and these will be our antecedents. So this is a good kind of fake data. And by the way, it was another filmmaker, Len Rostow, who was a comedy writer, who dubbed this scenario planning. Lucky us, Hollywood filmmakers weren't the only ones interested in what was going on with Kahn's work. Pierre Walk was a French strategist, and he worked for Dutch Shell Corporation. And he attended one of Kahn's retreats, uh, and um, he was just hooked. Talk about an underdog story. In the late 1960s, Shell was in such a weak financial position that Forbes had nicknamed it the ugly sister of the oil and gas industry. Well, Shell used scenario planning to transform itself into the beautiful swan. Tra scenario planning helped Shell prevail during many crises, including the 1973 energy crisis, the oil shock, uh, or the price shock of uh, 1979, the collapse of the oil and gas market in the 1980s, and the fall of the Soviet Union. One of two essential skills that every good leader must have is the ability to get things done. That's that goes without saying. What Walk realized is that there's something else that's equally important and harder to achieve. This is the ability to see ahead. He used to say, the more aware a wolf pack is of the terrain in which it runs, the more effectively it hunts. Shell had a lot on the line at the time. Most oil executives at the time couldn't imagine a world where there would be an energy crisis. But Walk and his team concluded that it would take a miracle to avoid an energy crisis. How did they reach this contrary conclusion? They did a deep dive to identify forces and drivers that were signaling change in the world. And they had the confidence to believe in what they learned. Someone, 30 years after the fact, said of Walk and his colleague, they came in and they showed us that you could open the window and look out at the world. I love that quote. Walk wrote an article for Harvard Business Review about Shell's work, and the title of his article says it all. He titled it, The Gentle Art of Reperceiving. Remembering this title may be your most important takeaway. It gets at the way in which using our imagination to create an ersatz experience, a plausible story, helps us in the here and now. And it shows that the way we see things really matters a great deal. In practice, scenario planning is never a one and done. The more you do it, the better you get at sensing these signals. You develop a sixth sense for them, and then the more useful they become to you. Many federal agencies have used scenario planning. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Coast Guard's use of it. Historically, the Coast Guard has a, has a reputation for individual heroism and tactical excellence. Its motto is Semper Paratus, which means always ready. So the Coast Guard absolutely must be ready to respond at the moment, as soon as it's summoned. If you get a mayday call from a ship in distress, you don't get to say, hey, I've got other things I've got to do first. So you can see how it's really easy for the Coast Guard to be ruled by the tyranny of the present. But by the 1990s, the scale, the frequency, and the strategic nature of change made them realize it wasn't enough any longer to be just a world-class responder. They also had to be a world-class planner. 
So Commandant James Loy started using scenario planning to help the Coast Guard anticipate the full range of possible futures they might be facing. This never was intended to replace their rapid reaction skills or their tactical excellence. Instead, it added to them the ability to see over the horizon, or as Walk said, the ability to see ahead. As with Shell, their starting point was gathering information. A key part of the process is to look at forces and drivers outside of your own immediate control. These are these really broad contextual questions about the world in which your organization exists. And then you think about what these signals may mean for your particular organization's mission. And you focus on the ones that most affect your work and most matter to you. Now here you can see the four dimensions the Coast Guard selected in its 2013 round of planning. One, will the U.S. economy be weak or strong? Two, will disruptions be traditional or novel? Three, will the role of the federal government be limited or substantial? And four, will global mobility be fluid or hindered? So these four dimensions give us 16 permutations or 16 possible future stories. The Coast Guard chose five to keep it manageable, and they created a plausible story for each of those five of what the Coast Guard's world would look like in 20 years or so. And they identified challenges and opportunities for the Coast Guard for each of these five stories. For example, in Dude, Where's My Sovereignty? The US has lost its mojo and the economy lags. A Coast Guard challenge in this story is that climate change has made degradation of shoreline facilities more of a problem. An opportunity for the Coast Guard in this story is that continued scarcity has given the Coast Guard the ability to plan for a leaner, flatter, and more flexible organization. In another story, Quantum Leap, a Coast Guard challenge is that the Arctic will be a nearly year-round waterway. An opportunity in this story is that the Coast Guard can exploit its field operations expertise, some of the best in the world, to build a stronger response and recovery partnership with another organization. So these stories the Coast Guard created gave it a stream of rich and diverse and thought-provoking information to work with. The process of imagining these stories moved the Coast Guard towards a much deeper understanding of what the future might hold for it. Peter Skoblik talks about cognitive ambidexterity. This is where you exploit existing competencies while building new ones. Scenario planning helps us do exactly this. Creating plausible stories about the future helps us let more data about the world in without becoming overwhelmed by it. It helped the Coast Guard remain open to the unexpected and to see new things. Their first round of scenario planning pretty much gathered dust for a few years, very common. But the act of having engaged in scenario planning nonetheless played a vital role in their ability to respond quickly following 9-11. They rescued almost half a million people from lower Manhattan by boat. Scenario planning continues to help the Coast Guard take risks more confidently and see options more clearly. By the time they'd finished their third round of scenario planning 12 years after 9-11, it had helped them with a manifold number of, of decisions. So for example, decisions about workforce issues, their role in the Caribbean, their role in the Arctic, and the future of their day-to-day -day tactical operations. They continue to use scenario planning to identify a core of strategic imperatives that are going to be important no matter what the future holds. I started this talk by pointing out how our imagination can help us see what plausible futures might exist and how those insights can help us shape the future and what to do in the here and now. No one ever invented something that someone didn't imagine first. How can we use our imagination to figure out what might change in the universe the OIG works in? How do drones affect our work? Will biorecognition make it impossible for us to protect the identity of our agents? Will every agency continue to have its own OIG? Is it possible Congress might decide the cost of OIGs outweighs their usefulness? Will SIGI morph over time to become a central consolidated OIG for all agencies? The future won't wait for us. Let's use our imaginations now 
to make the OIG's future what we want it to be. And maybe someone here today will become a model for a character in a future Wes Anderson movie. Thank <laughs> you.